Hello. Today we're going to talk about sprints and how that contrasts with a waterfall approach. So agile versus waterfall. This is an attempt to improve collaboration and the sort of quality of output that we have for retainer clients. Now, of course, this doesn't have to have a retainer, but it certainly does help. And let's go over that. So there are several values of a retainer approach. You get consistent billing, you have greater access to a large talent pool, you can ensure continuous improvements and prioritize things with business and user need alignment. We want to prove a return on investment and create a strategic partnership with a team committed to success, not just turning wrenches, but being proactive. Now with Waterfall, a lot of times we'll start off with a little bit of risk, a little bit of investment, but that risk and investment starts to compile over time. Eventually coming to a head with tons of money, tons of risk, because all of your output all of your deliverable product comes at the very end. What happens if we want to change a feature? What happens if funding dries up prematurely? You don't have anything to show for it. There's a lot of risk. Now with Agile, we instead focus on producing something iteratively over time. Risk is a little bit higher upfront, but the cost is consistent across the board. So what this does is it gives us the ability to say, if there's a lower priority feature that comes later on, we could theoretically pull it, change it. Either way, if it's something that might require a little time to explore and there's still something to build immediately, we can build something immediately and have it functional, have it usable, and there's value to that investment. This also improves team collaboration because they are seeing results. They get that satisfaction of producing something, seeing it, and working with the client on it much earlier. So the client isn't seeing this enormous mountain of things at the very end where it's separated by spans of time where they decided on design and strategy for those things many months uh, ago and probably forgot a good bit of detail. We also want to reduce the amount of waste in producing things. Less waste, more quality, more product. So let's kind of step backwards for a second and talk about the traditional story of waterfall. What does that process look like? Well, you already know what this process looks like because you've probably done it a number of times. The traditional process is monolithic. And when we take a look at things on a timeline, it's very sequential. So you'll typically have discovery, overlapping with design, overlapping with development, overlapping with deployment, but you'll see there's a disconnect between discovery and de development and even design and development. There can be spans of time between these sort of things, which means if something changes, do you go back to design? Do you go back to doing discovery? How does this loop? Oftentimes it doesn't, you just stuck with the plan and there's no ability to adjust, it's very rigid. And with bigger projects, this is a much bigger risk. And with testing, this also doesn't really give you the ability to adjust the design. It leaves a lot on the development team. Is the development team really equipped to change design, change strategy? So this kind of mucks up some of the budgetary side of things too when changes occur and well, we are organic. <laughs> Humans will make changes over time either because they weren't sure until things teased out or just because priorities change, needs change. And this produces one very large deliverable at the end. A lot of times clients have a heavy burden when there's a big system to have to test because there's a lot to have to go over and they have to reference a lot of information that they may have gone through during discovery and during design. Once more, throughout this process, 
the burn rate is very inconsistent. You kind of ramp up a little bit through discovery. You onboard the design team, start ramping up there, onboard the development team, ramp up there. And towards the end, we oftentimes see kind of that final push overlapping with testing and training and getting content in there. It's an accelerating pace and it gets very panicked at the very end. And well, not many good decisions come from panic. So let's talk about sprints and how this can help remedy things. Now, I'm a bit more of a purist <laughs> when it comes to this. And I think there's a, a large reluctance due to lack of familiarity, lack of training. That is something that we can certainly address together. We're not addressing that in this presentation. We're simply talking about here's why it's different and what the advantage is. So sprints allow for uncertainty. Technical solutions change quickly in our technology world. And we also want to work with less waste and prove our success, not just build the thing and say, hey, we succeeded because we built the thing. That's not good enough. Building a thing should produce a result. And if it doesn't produce a result, that's okay. You want to fail early. If you theorize that a blog would be great for your audience and they're like, oh, I don't want to read this. This is not really good. Well, what are you going to do? You just spent a ton of money on something. Well, build small. Don't invest as much. Understand the relationship that you have with your clients. You're there to help improve their business and to help improve their customer's experience. So the design and discovery and development and deployment, all of these layers start to smush together. Think of this as kind of a 90 degree pivot where all of these things can coexist. You can always do research. You can always create new designs. You can always build something small. Maybe there's another thing that you didn't think of when you built the thing and you go back and get some design or maybe there's some more research on an API or some new technology that you might wanna incorporate for a good interactive UI element. It's all possible. And you should be constantly deploying. So what this looks like in terms of sprints is a lot of times at the very beginning, you'll do a little initial discovery. Just make sure that we understand the broad sense of things. How do we measure success? Who is this for? How does this help your business? How does this help your users? What do your users expect? What do you currently have? How might this change? What are the current frustrations? There's a lot of groundwork that you wanna lay at the very beginning, just to make sure that you get some ducks in a row, some high level things. Those questions may evolve over time. The answer may change over time and you should be accepting of that possibility. So discovery happens throughout. Each one of these lines represents a theoretical sprint, roughly speaking. A sprint ideally should try to produce something functional, testable, but it doesn't happen every sprint. Sometimes you're being a little bit more iterative than that. And maybe you have a smaller team, maybe you have quicker sprint cycles, but you need to produce something testable. And that's where releases come in. And you'll typically set up a release plan. That's okay, it can change. Point being is that each one of those releases contains multiple features. And those features typically in a board like Jira can go into epics. And within those epics, you have a series of tasks that really anybody on your team can work on. There could be research, there could be design, there could be building, there could be building from multiple people, maybe front end developers, back end developers. There's testing, but that testing might not just be one person, that could be multiple people. Accessibility testing, security testing, usability testing, user acceptance testing, client testing. When is the content coming in? Well, as you build the pieces, maybe you put the content in a little bit at a time. And these are provable things. So you start off with the most important and most foundational things first. Maybe it's you know landing pages, basic pages. Then maybe you get to the blog and maybe you have an event calendar and then maybe you have some educational programs or something like that. What if midstream, before you really get too invested in maybe the events or the uh, blog, 
the client says, well, you know what? We saw this third party. You know what? We're going to put the blog over here. Or maybe for calendaring, we're going to use this third party system for that. Just link out to it. Well, if you haven't even done any discovery work or design work or building work on that thing, you haven't really wasted anything. Once again, we take a look at the burn rate too. With a retainer model, you'll typically have a known budget per month. What you do with that budget is relatively known because you know what your priorities are. And if you know your priorities, you've been doing your good release planning and your sprint planning, you know who's involved so you can handle resourcing. But what's important here is that the budget is predictable. The product, the what you're producing is predictable because you know what your priorities are. You know what you're focused on iteratively. Sometimes we can start with a, a common starting point as well. Maybe it's a, a, a Drupal distribution, gets you most of the way there, and then you're just tailoring it to your needs. This is a great idea. If you were building a website for yourself, for some purpose, maybe it's for some large event that you want to host, or maybe it's for your own blog or some sort of a portfolio. You don't have to start from scratch. And the same is true for any client project. Using a common start can short circuit the process of having to recreate the wheel. <laughs> if it already exists, use it. Create once, use many. And this doesn't have to be huge. This doesn't have to be like using a Drupal distribution like Open Atrium or uh, Open EDU or something like that. This could be little pieces too that you pull in. I need this piece and that piece and that piece and it still short circuits the common things that you're doing. That also helps with demos. You can show a client what already exists and set some early expectations as to how you might modify those things. So that's the theory. How do we operationalize this? Well, the basic idea of sprinting in this manner is to involve research, involve design, and involve build. How much of each of those is in each sprint really depends on what the needs are. Sometimes it's going to be more research heavy, sometimes more design heavy, and sometimes more build heavy. But it's about supporting outcomes, not about supporting how many hours uh, a resource can get, it's how many are needed to make progress and be efficient. How do we put all of this into action? Well, we definitely want to establish a good team. And this could be your A team. <laughs> we certainly want every team to be the A team. But understand what the strengths are of each person when you're assembling a team and know how they're going to ebb and flow in and out of a project to keep that consistent burn. Make sure that the expectations for the project are very well known from the very uh, early point and share that with the team. Open up good communication channels, not just internal, but with your clients and stakeholders and decision makers. Make sure that you understand from a high level what the features even are. What are you building? Not, not how. Don't worry about the how. Think about what. What is the outcome that we're seeking? We'll, we'll work backwards from there. And then try to prioritize those things. So that way you're building the most important piece first and then moving sequentially. That allows us to pull out pieces and add pieces as necessary within that plan without a lot of waste. We want that living task list, the backlog, if you will, and a release plan. These are not the same things. A task list is very granular. This is the how. What are we building exactly? How are we getting to that? That involves design, research, things as well. But a release plan is much higher level. Think of it as high and low, broad and deep. So the release plan is more, okay, over a course of timeline, what features come out first, second, third, et cetera? And can we put a time on the calendar for those things? It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be ready for some adjustments. Work together to create design concepts. Developers may have some insight for a designer about how something functions or how the community has a component. Go take a look at that component and see if the designer can kind of put some better branding on it, some styling to make it look like it fits within the website. 
work together. You want to test each software release by itself, not at the very end, but as you go, because if you identify the little tweaks that you need to make along the way, it's less of a burden. And let's be honest, some features kind of play together. If you address issues earlier, you don't have to refactor throughout the system much later and you reduce waste there. You also want to try to find ways to learn as a team, identify opportunities for improvements. Every person has a different perspective on what an improvement looks like. This could be a technical improvement. This could be a usability improvement. This could be an information or content improvement. And not all of them need to happen. Just because you identify an opportunity doesn't indicate any sort of a commitment. It just goes into the backlog and you prioritize as needed. Learning is our currency though. It's not money, it's not product, it's about learning first. Now, it doesn't mean that money isn't important and it doesn't mean that product isn't important, but if you can learn along the way, you can make it better, you can save money. And do you want to do, do that early, fail early. Failure is not an option, that's a terrible, <laughs> that's a terrible statement. Failure is always an option, how are you prepared? So learning can help you prepare. And we can base these approaches on industry practices. There are standards like uh, those found in Lean Startup, the Build, Measure, Learn loop, Agile Development using sprints, using backlogs, appropriate meetings. And there's also IBM's design thinking approach, which kind of pulls a lot of this stuff together with human-centered design, working very directly with you, your users, making sure that there's a, a clear process to uh, plan, design, build, test and kind of loop all that together in a way that your team kind of develops a cadence. So how does that all happen? Well, first there's some planning involved and there's some distinct planning steps that, uh, for example, Scrum will point out in terms of their agile approach. Now there are other agile approaches. Kanban's another popular one. That can be a pretty good option when it comes to support clients or uh, continuous improvements. But if you're building something new, Scrum tends to be a little bit stronger of an option as long as your team has the maturity and the discipline to stay committed to this process. So first is backlog grooming. What are the things that we can do? How do those individual tasks kind of fit together in who needs to do what and not get in each other's way? What can happen sequentially? What can happen concurrently? And that takes a team's conversation. Ultimately, it is the product owner who represents the interests of multiple parties, including your client and your users. And they kind of help work with your team to identify, okay, what do we do first? I know I want to accomplish this first, but is there some step that has to happen before then? That helps you with your tasking writing good acceptance criteria, um, making sure that before things are worked on, they're good estimates, you know, groom the backlog and it takes a team and it does take time, but the, the more you do it, the faster you get at it and the more you're communicating early instead of making lots of assumptions and there being disasters towards the end, invest in backlog grooming. Release planning, that's that high level, that broad scope that we were talking about. This is not about tasks, this is about the features that capture all of, all of those tasks. This is the what, not the how. You're producing a blog section. You're producing an event calendar. You're producing a shopping cart. You're producing product pages. Whatever it may be, you're itemizing those things, not too granularly, just more of a concept. So that way, when you release that, anybody can point their finger at it and say, yep, those are the product pages. There might be nuance with what shows up on those pages and how they function, but at least you can point your finger at it and say, yep, they released the product pages. Put that on the timeline, be willing to change that over the course of time. Sprint planning. Well, you've got your backlog, you've groomed it, it's ready to go. Now you're gonna pull the stuff right from the top of the backlog because it's already prioritized. What fits in your sprint? Who can participate? Do the numbers look good? Is everybody using good commitment language? I will do X by Y. Within the sprint, whether it's a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is, anybody that pulls a task into that sprint 
unless something terrible happens, they're committed to finishing those tasks. Sprint reviews. Well, you've done some work. Now it's time to look at that work as a team to figure out how things went, what sort of curveballs may have come up, some sort of challenges that the team may have faced. And this helps be honest about what it is that you were capable of doing. And over time, these sprint reviews should be a little bit easier, a little less stressful, a little less frustrating as you develop a cadence and you want to involve the client stakeholders because you are responsible for the work that you're producing and showing them, hey, here's the progress we made. And it's not just about building, it's also about striving to get to something to help them and their users. Sprint reviews also help you in that cycle of preparing for the next sprint planning. If you know what work you just did, you can better prepare for the next sprint. And of course, once you get into those build cycles, that is iterative as a team, you conduct research, you create design concepts, you build functional software features, and you validate with user testing each little piece. Then you monitor and adjust. So a, a product owner or project manager, if you will, will take a look at the velocity of the team to be honest about how effective and efficient we're being and adjust the cadence as necessary so that way we're not bloating our sprints with too many tasks based on historic analysis. Build, measure, learn. Again, this is a much deeper, deeper subject. Please read the book. It's a very good one for anybody in this industry to at least be aware of. The basic premise is you're getting in a loop and you're using real measurable data points, not subjectivity, not emotions, not opinions, but real data to measure how successful little pieces are being. Now, if you haven't produced the piece that's measurable, then you can't measure it yet. But once you build something, it has a responsibility. You invested your money in something that was built. Now it has a responsibility fulfilling the value proposition that was originally there, or we as a team will understand what failure looks like and then come up with ideas in a restrained, mature manner to either pull the feature that was built because it's not satisfying its value proposition or improving upon it to try to bring it to that point. And learning, remember, that's our currency. Measurements help us learn. They don't tell the full truth, they tell us a part of the truth. It's up to us and all of our individual perspectives to understand what facts we can analyze and how that informs any sort of opportunities we have to make improvements. And just because there's an opportunity we identify does not mean we are committed to it. We're just looking at it, learning from it, writing down what we think makes sense and leaving it there. Then we decide as a team through those previous meetings, what are we actually building? Just because we can doesn't mean we will. From there, I would draw your attention to the much deeper topic of IBM's design thinking process. This is a lot and we'll break it down a little bit here, but understand this is a very mature model for much larger enterprise types of uh, production. I would not recommend this for small projects. This is great for good human centered uh, design and it involves the whole team through the whole process. So bringing this to that level of maturity, we first look at what what is that MVP? And then what is that midterm? Well, first, that minimum viable product. How do you know something's viable? Well, you have to test it. And through this process, we, we start to ideate what an MVP could be. And then we try to work through that solution as a team, doing research, design, and building, and testing showing that to users, working with users, iterating to the point where something small is functional, usable, and we can say that is our minimum viable product. It's not doing everything that everybody wants, but it is functioning for its core purpose. Then you move into more of a phase two. It's the iterating to the point of improving. You pay attention to your measurables, you work as a team, you listen to feedback, both from stakeholders and users, and you iterate over that to continually en enrich and improve the thing that you've started to work on. 
during the MVP, there are different portions of those cycles. So user research, uh, doing some pre-workshop uh, preparation, you know, validated personas, uh, different scenarios, uh, some small low fidelity concepts. Then as you move into the workshop, you start doing more uh, detailed things like user story mapping, user journey mapping, prototypes. After your workshops, uh, do some prototype testing and does design prioritization. Try to tease out these concepts, validate that this is a good direction, tease out the variations of things that you can do. And then during your agile triage, do your release planning. Plan for the work that you're attempting to do. As you move into the midterm, you're kind of dialing things into a more refined process. So revisiting the website strategy and adding sort of additional, any sort of additional discovery to explore new concepts or ways of really enriching what it is that you can provide to your audience. Going through the design and build iterations and then deployments. So there's, there's much of the same, but it's really just hitting that level of cadence with the team to really refine this thing. Within those design and build iterations, this is where that high fidelity scrum comes into play. There's a lot going on here, so we're not gonna look at every granular thing, but some of this is similar to what we were just looking at before. The important thing is understanding that during these iterations, there are two concurrent efforts. One is, what are you building right now? In this sprint, there is some active development happening right now. And design is there to be supportive. Sometimes you are doing design concepts right leading up to building the actual thing. That can happen within a single sprint. There's also next iteration planning, things that you're going to build later, but not in this sprint, and doing designs for that doing some user testing for that. So some are small design investments, some are much longer term, larger design investments and knowing how you're breaking that up is important. So in the current iteration, you're designing, you're doing UX concepts. So that is flows and how, how people have different emotional states, thoughts, what is frustration, what is success, doing a design review, doing a demo for stakeholders, building it and implementing it, and also doing some of that planning work. So more backlog grooming, preparing uh, the backlog every single iteration to make sure that there's an opportunity for adjustment and it's a routine, not a reaction. Sprint planning, same thing, it's a routine. You know that you're preparing for the next sprint. In the next iteration, you're also doing bigger bet design work bigger bet uh, user testing. So that way you can see how is the thing that we had previously built going to be tweaked if that's something that we're focused on or more ideation and user experience, more review. So taking a step aside from the details, the differences between waterfall and agile. So typically we think of the um, project management iron triangle is what you see here on, on the left, the waterfall. So scope is fixed. This is absolutely what we're producing. We're estimating our resources and we're estimating our time. That is the traditional model. If scope changes, then obviously our estimates and time need to change. With agile, we turn this a bit. So with the retainer model, the resources and the time is fixed. We know what that is. Now that can change based on a contract change, but otherwise that is a known value. And it is the scope that is estimated. We think that with 60 hours a month with these people on the team that we can produce uh, this per sprint or per month or per whatever the cadence is. And that's just an estimate. You don't know what you're going to be successful in doing. Maybe a client or a bunch of users identify a need to dive a little bit deeper into something and you spend a little bit more time on it. Well, you enrich it, you bring it to a place of greater success. And in another respect, you may identify a lower priority item that users produced some sort of feedback or survey results saying, you know what, I, I, I realized that you didn't, that didn't know what I wanted. Well, I'm telling you, this is what I want and that's not it. So you can pull things from scope. That's absolutely fine too in Agile. It's 
the name <laughs> kind of gives you the hint. You can make changes along the way. But you don't ever want to pretend that all of these things are fixed. It is a point of disaster. If resources, time, and scope are all collectively fixed, one of those things will produce something that you don't expect. So you may go over budget, you're eating that budget. You may go over time, you're hurting that relationship. You may not produce the things you expect. Well, that's not good either. <laughs> so the bottom line is this helps you do good work. That's, it's as simple as that. It's not the only way of doing things. And there are th some takeaways that you can incorporate from this without adopting absolutely every facet of this. But I, I would highly encourage identifying the projects to pilot test this one. Give it a shot. Make sure that your team is trained, certified, you know, whether it's a, a scrum certification or a similar sort of agile uh, framework. Look at that. Take a look at IBM's design thinking. Start with leadership and work your way down. If leadership doesn't understand these concepts fully, then that may impact how the team dynamic works and how management works. So it should certainly start there as well. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to this uh, presentation on the differences between uh, Agile and Waterfall and how it could be adopted by your team for greater success.